Good morning, everybody. Good, good morning, Matthew. Thank you. How are you all today? I am well, too. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm pleased. Thank you, Richard. That was a lovely introduction. You've done quite a bit of work for me, so that's great. Um, and it's good to know I am working in the best place, which is digestive. Digestive health is the number one and most important. Although, having heard all that talk about bowel motions and stool charts and such like, I'm, I'm reconsidering that. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, Project A2 Milk for Gut Comfort. So this is an HVN contestable project and um, as you might have guessed it is business led with the A2 Milk Company. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is a little bit of background on what is the story behind A2 and is it different from A1 and if so why. Um, bearing that in mind, where does this project fit into that story? What is it that we hope to achieve over the course of the project? And how are we going to do that? Um, and I think I'll do that well within my time limit. Um, so, A2 Milk. Hands up if you've heard of A2 Milk. Good. Excellent. Uh, hands up if you bought shares in A2 Milk. Yeah, I was disappointed. So A2 milk, um, bovine milk has uh, something in excess of 200 different proteins. It may be higher than that. Um, what is definitely known as one of these is beta casein, which can be up to 25, 30% of the total protein. And there are several well-characterized variants in the gene which encodes that protein. And some of those genetic changes do result in a change to the protein sequence. And some of those changes to the protein sequence may have functional consequences. So originally, all cows produced only the A2 variant of beta casein. Um, but uh, the, the numbers vary, but somewhere between five and 10,000 years ago in some European dairy herds, a mutation arose, which was the A1 beta casein variant. And this is now the most widespread form. Generally today, most milks that you would buy would have a mixture of the two, um, but milk products produced by A2 contain only the A2 form of beta casein, so that's their point of differentiation. Okay, so we heard uh, when, when Bruce talked yesterday, um, obviously you, you drink milk, you consume milk and it's broken down and digested in various ways. One of the Digestion products of milk is uh, peptides called casomorphins. And the one of particular interest is beta casomorphin 7 or BCM7. Um, now what we know is that A1 types of beta casein, due to that change in the peptide structure, when they break down, they produce BCM7 at relatively high levels, just due to the, the um, point at which the digestion occurs. If you compare that with A2 types, then they're cut at a different point, and so they produce significantly less BCM7. So this is just one of the potential functional differences, or one of the, one of the digestive differences between A1 and A2 is a change in the level of BCM7. Human beta casein is like A2, not A1 beta casein, in terms of this BCM7 breakdown, and also goat and sheep milk are com comparable to A2 and rather than A1. And so A1 is the one which produces more of this BCM7. So approximately up to 10% of the theoretical human equivalent comes when you digest human beta casein. And there are differences with, within the structure as well as at the point of, at which it is digested, which mean that is more potent. So BCM7 from Bovine is more potent than some of the other, than the human equivalent. And so two important potential differences is the amount that's produced and the potency at which it acts. I'm getting a nod from my business stakeholder, so that's good. So what does this all mean? Um, so the, the interest started with some epidemiological studies indicating there's possible differences in disease risk associated with consumption of A1 versus A2 milk. And this is somewhat controversial research, and I won't go into it in great detail. Um, part of the reason we're doing this research is to try and give definitive answers to some of these questions. 
More recent work in both animals and humans is more about immediate effects um, and, for example, digestive comfort. So now, thanks to Richard, we know a lot more about how you might measure digestive comfort. Um, we know that consumers, are ca really, they care about now. So we, there was a bit of talk yesterday about how do you sell a future health proposition to people. It's difficult because I may or may not get a, a long-term disease when I'm 60, but I don't know if that's going to make me spend an extra 50% on a product. If I drink something and there's an immediate response in terms of my digestive comfort, then I might consider. Um, so I think that's, that's an important aspect of consumer pull. Um, and I think Nicole pointed out pretty well, it's generally accepted a healthy gut means better overall health. So that's why we're sort of targeting this area. Um, there is some growing preclinical data, and so animal models and such like, um, comparing consumption of a standard milk, which would contain either pure A1 variant or a mixture of the two compared to A2. And there's fairly good evidence that it may impact on intestinal transit and it may also influence the inflammatory response. There's also some quite recent human clinical data, um, which I'll talk about a bit more. Um, this is a study done in China, where if you compare standard with A2 milk, then there may indeed be differences in intestinal comfort, intestinal physiology, and possibly cognitive behavior. And I'm not gonna go into this a lot, but we've heard the importance of the gut-brain axis. Um, so this is something that we may look at in future. And the mechanisms of this may relate to the release of bioactive peptides such as BCM7. So there is in vitro work to show that BCM7, which has come from A1 beta casein, can trigger inflammation in human cells but we need to provide better evidence that this is the case in vivo and in appropriate human studies. So, excuse me. Sorry, all this hot air tends to dry my mouth out. So where does this project specifically lead in? Um, there's good evidence many Asian consumers consider themselves to be lactose intolerant and they therefore avoid dairy products. Um, so, the figures are up to 90% in certain Asian countries, and we've heard that obviously Asia is an important potential market, and particularly China. There's recent data to suggest that, in fact, it's not lactose which is the primary cause of this discomfort, uh, that it may be due to inflammation in the small intestine, and as I've briefly mentioned before, this inflammation may be a response to A1 beta casein. Okay, so this is just some data from that China study. Um, uh, so this, on the, on the y-axis there, the, there's a, an, a, basically a total score of intestinal comfort. So it kind of summarizes, there was a table that James showed, and we know we're not supposed to show tables. So this graph summarizes the table. I think that's what we're supposed to do. So. Um, I think it's reasonably straightforward. So along the, along the bottom, People on this side, you can see that, well, this is the weeks of the study. Weeks of the study, good. Um, so the, the first one is week zero, i.e. no consumption of anything. The, this was a crossover design, similar to what um, Richard has described. So weeks one and two, the consumers pr had the first type of milk. Then there was a washout period, weeks three and four. Five and six, they, they consumed the different milk. Um, and so... The blue graph is people who had A1 milk first, and in their second period they had A2 milk, and the red is the opposite. So in the first period they had A2 milk, and the second they had A1. And I think it's reasonably conclusive that whichever order you did it in, the A1 milk in these particular consumers tended to increase their levels of discomfort. So this, we think, is, is some important clinical data we can build on, which suggests there is a difference in the way people respond to these two types of milk. Um, and from the same study, they measured a bunch of stuff. Um, and this one is plasma levels of certain things. And there, so there was increased serum IL-4, IgG, and IgE. So there's some evidence that there's an inflammatory response happening. And these were increased as a result of A1 relative to A2 milk. So our question is, how can we build on this evidence? So what we hope to achieve is to generate, 
I think John made me use the word clinically significant evidence that some consumers who currently avoid dairy can tolerate O2 milk. To better understand the mechanisms through which this intolerance may occur, and BCM7 is an example, we need to understand that better. Um, this is all building towards contributing evidence for the A2 milk company to make appropriate health claims and long-term increased dairy consumption in China. Now, we really only care about increased dairy consumption in China because hopefully that will be increased consumption of New Zealand dairy products, which leads to increased export dollars, which therefore delivers to the HVN mission. Isn't that right, David? Good. Oh, I am in the right place, excellent. How are we going to do this? So we're going to test the hypothesis that A2 milk does not induce adverse symptoms of gut discomfort in consumers with perceived lactose intolerance. It's snappy, it's short, I think you like it. I haven't come up with an acronym yet, because clinical trials have acronyms, don't they, Sally? Like Panama. I will, I, I will tell you that at 6.23 on my way home yesterday, I was listening to the sound and Van Halen Panama came on. <laughs> and so I thought you could have a theme tune. <laughs> I, I have been thinking about it and I thought A, A2 milk for intestinal comfort could be atomic. I'm getting nods, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't really thought that through. <laughs> Sorry, oh, so it's six minutes, I better get moving. Right. Um, so that's what we're going to do. That's what we plan to do. How are we going to do it? So we're going to do some clinical studies, standard milk versus A2 milk. Now we're going to do a range of outcome measures. Um, so self-reported intestinal symptoms. So Richard gave a lovely rundown on that. So pretty much that's what we're going to do. How do people feel after they consume these different milks? In our case, it will be double-blinded. So unlike kiwi fruit, you can disguise milk as a different milk. And so the consumers won't know what they're drinking. The people who give it to them won't know. Um, only once we do the analysis, we'll know. We're going to do some, um, some MRI imaging of the small intestine. So this is the cool and funky stuff that we plan to do. I just had to say that to get my bottle of wine, cool and funky. Um, so there is the potential to use these imaging techniques to see in very fine detail changes in a very short time frame. And so we're going to try and understand, to follow the, the milk through the gut and see whether there are changes in digestion, whether there's evidence that the gut is becoming inflamed. We're going to take some uh, plasma samples and measure metabolites and cytokines to look for some evidence of inflammation. And also, um, Nicole talked briefly about breath volatiles. Sorry, you carry on your conversation, that's fine. Um, breath volatile metabolites. So when you consume foods, does it change the metabolite profile of your breath? And potentially, could this long-term lead to a diagnostic where you can quickly tell someone whether or not they can consume normal milk or they have to stick with A2? Um, we're also going to do some in vitro studies in parallel to try and understand better some of the mechanisms that are associated. Uh, so using purified and SGID, simulated gastrointestinal digested, that's what it means. So purified A1 and A2 casein and also the, the digestion byproducts of those to see if they influence these cells in terms of their inflammatory response. So do they change cytokine release, both pro and anti-inflammatory cytokines, and also do they influence microRNA release from these cells? I won't go into detail about that, but again, another factor which may be relevant to inflammation. So the outcomes from this work is we want to demonstrate health benefits of A2 milk for improving gut comfort in a particular group of consumers. And obviously we want to contribute to the A2 milk company's mission, which is to pioneer the scientific understanding of A2 milk so we can bring more people the pleasure and nutritional goodness that only comes from real and natural milk. That was my endorsement. <laughs> Obviously, we want to support the A2 Milk Company to submit a dossier for a high-level health claim, meeting New Zealand regulations and obviously those in the key international markets, and that could include China, potentially the US. There's a number of jurisdictions that we might consider. Um, and the end goal is increase value to the New Zealand supply chain. So that would be at the point of uh, farmers, process, ingredient manufacturers, and also shareholders. 
So, uh, some people to acknowledge, obviously HVN, um, in their wisdom for selecting this project to be funded. I can only commend them on that. Um, A2 Milk Company, um, really solid financial backing as well as uh, clear vested interest in this project. The University of Auckland, with whom we're going to do the clinical studies, so David Cameron-Smith will be leading those, and uh, also the, the Centre for Advanced MRI, who are helping us with the imaging. And the members of the team, so we've heard a lot about um, how the team's important and bringing people together. Uh, so this team includes people from AgriSearch, from the University of Auckland and from A2. Um, so we think we've got the right team pulled together to make this work. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>